I'd like to take a moment and thank you and thank everybody who helped me put this night together. Jerry Williams of the Mars Society of San Diego, Jesse Clark, Chris Radcliffe, and Dave Dressler of the San Diego Space Society. Without them, tonight would not have happened. These groups, along with SEDS, are dedicated to spreading the word about space and how important it is to our future. Let's give a warm round of applause and thank them for the job they've done. I'd also like to make a special note about certain groups that are represented here tonight. I'm pleased to say that we have representatives here from the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, both the UCSD chapter and the San Diego region, the Persian Club at UCSD, and students and faculty members from mechanical and aerospace engineering, electrical and computer engineering, and the physics departments here at UCSD. Let's give another one warm round of applause and welcome these special guests. I knew of the Ansari family way before I knew Anusha. In 2004, Bert Rutan and his company, Scale Composites, won the Ansari X Prize, which was a $10 million prize for whoever could build and fly the first privately built spaceship and fly it into space twice within two weeks. Of course, this was a huge success, and the, Ansari and the Ansari name went into history. Last September, I attended the SEDS National Conference, which was held at MIT in Boston. It was there that I met Anusha and invited her to come share with us what it was like to be in space. Thankfully, she accepted my invitation and here she is with us tonight. Please help me welcome space explorer and fellow space enthusiast, Anusha Ansari. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and thanks, James, for inviting me and all the organization, including SETS, for making tonight possible. Uh, I love going to different universities and schools and uh, talking about my experience because I tend to see a lot of um, enthusiastic individuals with uh, ideas and bright uh, uh, future ahead of them that includes space in, the, in that future. And I like to talk to them about my experiences and make them feel closer to the future that awaits them. I have this uh, short presentation that sort of tells my story and then I, the best part of the presentation is if you endure through the PowerPoint is the video I have at the end which is mostly the footage I took on board the space station and everyone seems to like that piece the best so just work with me here. Um, I was born um, in a, I was born a long long time ago actually in a country far far away uh, in a, a city called Mashhad in Iran. And uh, I lived in Iran, grew up in Iran, until I was about 16 years old. Uh, all the time in Iran growing up, there was one thing on my mind, and that was space. Uh, I remember summer nights sleeping on the balcony of my grand grandparents' house uh, and just gazing at the stars. And I was very young. I don't know how old I was, uh, probably before I even started going to school. And the mystery and um, the... the the, the things that was um, mostly important to me was just being able to let my imagination go. And looking at the stars and looking at the night skies allowed me to do that. And I loved it. So growing up, I kept telling everyone, I'm going to grow up to be an astronaut. I'm going to go to space. Um, I'm going to um, be a scientist and study space and all these things. And uh, sure enough, in Iran, a country that doesn't have a space program, uh, my parents thought that, you know, I'll, I'll grow out of it and I'll forget about it. And they just, you know, let me, you know, say these things, but never believed me. Uh, nevertheless, uh, being called crazy or a dreamer didn't stop me from pursuing that dream and keeping that dream alive. So when I came here to U.S. when I was about 16 years old, 
the first thought on my mind was, well, this is my opportunity to become an astronaut. Of course, um, the opportunity didn't materialize, not being a U.S. citizen and not um, having, uh, I didn't even speak English when I came here. Um, and I didn't have a lot of the support structure that I had back in Iran. So coming here, like a lot of other immigrants who come here, the first thing we had to think about is what do I study to get a job? So that's what I did. I went to engineering, which was a growing field back then, uh, became an electrical engineer. I went to uh, George Mason and, uh, to get my bachelor's degree and then George Washington to get my uh, master's in electrical engineering and basically build a career in uh, telecommunication. That's how I met my husband. So I don't regret going the engineering route. And uh, together we built a company called Telecom Technology. It became very successful and uh, we ended up selling the company in 2000, uh, year 2000. We got very lucky, I have to say. It wasn't any magic or special knowledge that I had about the market. But um, that's when I actually was able to pursue my dream. All along, building a career and being completely away from space didn't stop me from, you know, at least following it as a hobby, I would say. Um, I even made the entire management team at my company um, dress up in Star Wars characters, fully dressed uh, for one of our employee meetings, and they didn't appreciate that. But, <laughs> but it, it was my way of just keeping things alive and interested. So uh, space has been a big part of my life, and I think it's a big part of everyone's life. When you look at things that you see in this picture, necessarily you don't, you're not thinking about space, but a lot of the technology used in building uh, materials or devices that we use on a daily basis uh, is as a result of uh, space program or space exploration. Or a lot of uh, uh, programs that today help us with predicting weather patterns, studying Earth, studying our environment, uh, and monitoring it is the result of satellite. Or satellite TVs, GPS system, a lot of these things that we don't think about it, but uh, they would not be here or they would not be as advanced perhaps if it wasn't for the space program. So space has helped us um, detect and um, solve a lot of problems on Earth. And it will continue to do that. And I think it will even play a bigger role in future for us. And that's one of the reasons I, I feel space is important for us um, in developing new materials, uh, in helping us access new forms of uh, energy and being able to harvest safely uh, resources in space will be able to add us a lot of issues that we struggle with on a daily basis. So as James said, space, in my opinion, is our future. And we need to, we need to be uh, taking it more seriously. And uh, right now, the first thing that usually gets cut out of the budget is the space program, but it gets cut down. And as a result of that, a lot of things that will be helping us in future doesn't get done. And one thing about the space program is that it takes a long time to develop the technology. And uh, it's not something that you say, well, for now we can cut the budget and we'll, you know, we'll start it back two years ago. So um, sometimes we have to be looking way into the future and be uh, much more futuristic in our uh, plans. And that's not what's happening. Uh, and this, this is something that I think is short, this type of short-sightedness sometimes is a char human character, I think. Uh, if you look at back, uh, years back, before we all had our own laptops and computers and we were used to our uh, Palm Pilots or all our handheld devices, there were people who believed that computers were just made for government agencies, for banks, for universities, and they never thought that such devices will be useful for individuals. Well, of course, there were dreamers out there also that thought differently, and they thought that each individual will be able to use power of computing and do things on their own. And as we know now today, looking back, hindsight is 2020, and we know that they were right. Because of that, a lot of that industry changed. For example, these old-style transistors you see in this picture, each one of them would cost about $6 back then in the 70s. Well, how many transistors do you think you can buy now with $6 if 
you were to spend six dollars, how many transistors do you think you would buy? Hundreds, millions, somewhere about, um, you would be able to buy somewhere about uh, over half a million transistors with just six dollars. And that, you know, that number keeps on growing because the prices keep, keep on coming down. Same thing happened in aviation. You see two important people that uh, they both played a big role in changing the face of aviation. Uh, and the person, the, to me, the most important person um, is not the handsome, tall guy that you see in the picture, but the other guy. Uh, Charles Ortigue was a Frenchman who came, who was a shepherd in France. He came to this country and started as a uh, waiter. waiter. And um, he built, he, he became very successful. Eventually, he became a very successful hotelier. He, his passion was aviation. So when he, he was able to afford it and he was very successful, he wanted to give back uh, and he wanted to do something related to what he was passionate about, which was aviation. So he put up the Ortique Prize, which the X Prize is modeled after. Uh, with his $25,000 prize, um, he inspired a lot of teams, a lot of different individuals to come up with different ways of building their planes so they can fly the uh, nonstop flight from New York to Paris to win uh, the prize. And finally, in 1926, um, Charles Lindbergh was able to win that prize. And uh, from that moment on, history changed for the aviation industry. Within only a short three years after that, the number of uh, people applying for a pilot license grew by 300%. Uh, the number of registered uh, aircraft grew by 400%. Um, the number of airports in the United States doubled. And uh, from having only 5,000 or 6,000 people fly every year, we went up to 170, 180,000 people flying each year. So that's how things started changing. And we were hoping to do the same thing with the Ansari X Prize. And uh, I think we're right at the verge of seeing that happen in the space industry. So as James mentioned, it was a prize to uh, get people to come up with a spaceship that would fly to the edge of space to do a suborbital flight twice within two weeks. And the twice within two weeks aspect of it was to demonstrate that this is a viable business, something that can be repeated. It's not just a uh, you know, science project. It's something that can be sustained. And uh, Bert Rutan in 2004 was able to win the prize. And uh, right before his second flight, which was the winning flight, um, Virgin Galactic announced that they will be commercializing, actually, Spaceship One, and will be pl flying commercial passengers, which was ultimately what we wanted to hear, because um, we needed the first uh, company to step up and do this, so we will have others following the lead. We had about uh, 16 countries uh, with 27 teams participating, and many of those teams are continuing building their space uh, crafts, and uh, some of them have gone to extend the time in, uh, sub in the suborbit uh, area, and also looking at ways of building it into uh, orbital flights. So all that is continuing. Mike, I think it's me. I can't speak too loud. Is it better now? You should have raised your hand, made some noise, do something. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, so that's what we wanted to do with uh, the with the X Prize, and in 2004, when Virgin Galactic uh, announced they're going to be able to, they will be commercializing Spaceship One. That was really ultimately our goal, and we were very happy to see that. And I'm happy to report that they're making great progress, and they're still on track to uh, fly their first commercial passengers in 2010. So. Uh, save your pennies, save your dollars, and uh, in 2010, you'll be able to buy one of these tickets. Of course, the goal is not to have just one company, and uh, when you will see an industry really uh, 
growing and thriving is when you will have competition. There are, I think, um, at least two more companies that are um, uh, building spaceships and they will be flying, if not at the same time as BERT, but um, sometime in, you know, a couple of years after that. Hopefully what I like to see, and I'm, I'm uh, I think it will happen within a 10 year, 10 to 15 years from the time we will start seeing this flight, the prices will get down to the 20s and $30,000, and that's when we will have a lot of people flying, and the more people they fly, the more the prices will come down. And uh, it will be like, you know, I may do a suborbital flight before coming here, and eventually maybe point to point. So we'll see where that goes. But we are very proud to have played a small role in, in making that happen. So whenever I go to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and I see Spaceship One hanging there next to uh, Spirit of San Luis, it's a, um, I'm very proud to see that. So it makes me feel really good to have been part of that. So how does all that translate into me flying on a Soyuz uh, aircraft to the space station? Well, um, I like this quote because um, I think it sort of says what happened to me because I was prepared. Um, I was uh, part, as part of XPRIZE Foundation and being involved with the space program, I was looking for the next thing. So uh, I knew that suborbital flights will be coming and I was waiting for uh, my time to come to uh, take my first seat in maybe a Spaceship 2 or Spaceship 3 aircraft. And uh, while I was doing that, we were looking at uh, designing other uh, prizes, one of which was the orbital flight. So as a result of that, I was offered the opportunity to go and train as a backup uh, with the Soyuz program in Russia. Of course, me being a space nut, I just couldn't say no to that opportunity. Training with all the astronauts and cosmonauts being where you're Gagarin train and um, going to the same place that he flew from was just a dream come true for me. So I went there and um, started training as if I would be flying to space. And um, about three weeks before the flight, the person that was actually supposed to fly um, failed one of his medical exam. I had nothing to do with that. A lot of people think I sabotaged it. I didn't. Um, so they offered me the opportunity. They said, uh, you know, do you want to go? And I'm like, are you kidding me? I've been waiting all my life to be able to fly to space. Of course I'm going to go. So it was instantaneous for me. And fortunately, because when I was going through the training, I trained as if I would fly. I was ready, and they felt comfortable that I would be able to handle the flight. And uh, that's how I ended up going to Kazakhstan instead of coming back home and uh, being able to uh, have the experience of my life. So September 18, um, 2006 is when I was able to fly to the International Space Station. Um, it was an amazing experience, not only because of the flight itself, but getting to learn about the space station and the fact that all these countries, about um, 16 countries, work together to make uh, this marvel of technology possible. And what amazed me the most was to see that, for example, R Russia had built a certain portion of the uh, ISS, and U.S. Has, had built other portion. And these uh, two modules would fly to space and actually come together, work together perfectly. How many times do you see that happen in normal, less complicated things that we do here on Earth? And if countries can work so nicely together to be able to build things that are so delicate and be able to bring them together and make them work together, I wish to be able to translate that in more things that other countries and different countries can do together. And the same thing happens with the astronauts. When I was up there, we had two Russians, two Americans. I was there and there was a German astronaut up there. And we all with different personalities, completely different personalities, uh, different language skills, uh, different cultures, all these things. And none of it mattered because once you're up there and you're in the space station, you know that if you don't like your neighbor, you can't just you know, open the door and throw them out. You know, it's, it's a small place. You have to be able to live together. And uh, if, if that can translate also in people seeing our Earth the same way, that it's just one place for all of us to live, 
There's no other place. We can't ignore the fact that we all share this planet together and we do things that will affect uh, other people around us. I think we'll have a more peaceful and more uh, friendlier environment to live in. Training was about six months uh, in Star City, the same place that all the cosmonauts train. Uh, it involved uh, learning about the Soyuz and the International Space Station, all the different devices and systems, learning uh, what to do in case of emergency. Of course, I had to learn uh, Russian, but I tell everyone I just learned space Russian because the <laughs> terminologies that were used were just related to the space program. And uh, also the best part of it is what you see in this corner, the zero-G flights. And I love them. And now they're available through Sharper Image, Zero G Corporation. You can actually uh, get a glimpse of what it feels to be in space. They're really, really cool. And I know they're known as Vomit Comet. I promise you they're not like that. You'll enjoy them. Um, so as I said, September 18, I was able to fly. Uh, the two crew members that flew with me were Michael Lopez Alegria. Uh, American astronaut and Mikhail Turin, who was a Russian cosmonaut. And uh, we flew on board the Soyuz, which is a, um, I think it's one of the tiniest capsules for a human space flight. It's, uh, it has room enough for three people to sit very tightly together uh, for the first portion of the launch and also during the descent. And um, that's the descent module in the middle. And then you have the orbital module or the habitat module where you can spend some time, because it takes two days to get to the space station. You launch, you get to the orbit quickly, but then you sort of have to chase the space station to get to the right position and be able to uh, dock with the space station. So um, it, you, you have a little bit more room, just enough for three people standing next to each other. And I have a picture of the inside of the Soyuz, you can see. Uh, the close quarters there. I mean, that corner, that's Michael, Mike L.A., and Mikhail Turin. But it was all worth it because by the time I got to the space station, the views were uh, unbelievable. Uh, these are pictures I took from the space station, and I was glued to the window for most of the time I was up there. Uh, I do point out this one picture, which is one of my favorite, is of the Persian Gulf, and I'd like to show it because I say, you know, all these, you know, things you talk about, wars and all the bad stuff, you see, you can't see any of it from up there. It's just really beautiful, and if you zoom, actually, you can't see it on this one, but on the actual picture, you can see the palms which uh, it's amazing to be able to see those structures from up there. Going the wrong way. Okay, so I think, okay. Um, on the space station, one thing that was interesting was it was like being a kid and learning everything for the first time again. So just moving around, eating food, you know, just doing your routines, because there's no shower or, uh, you know, just washing uh, your hair or brushing your teeth was a new experience. So I was just like a kid in the candy store. I participated in four of the European Space Agency um, experiments and um, spent some time doing that. And then a lot of the uh, rest of the time, I took a lot of videos and pictures and uh, used the ham radio. I talked to a lot of students around the world. And uh, also, I started doing a blog that became really um, popular. Uh, I don't know why, because I had never written anything publicly, except for my term papers that probably just my professors read. But other than that, I had never written anything before. But I guess just being able to share my experiences in a very layman term was something that people could connect with. And they, um, I, I mean, we had about, by the time I returned, um, we had about 25 million hits on the website, and it was, you know, from all over the world. And I had people from, I remember one of the people who commented was actually uh, during the, he, he was actually in the front line and in Iraq and uh, saying that, you know, he was, uh, the highlight of his day was reading my blog every morning, and I'm like, that's, that, that was really something. And it just, just to tell you the reason I think most people connected with it was it gave them hope. So whatever situation they were in, um, no matter how bad it was, 
it helped them believe that, you know, things can change. The same thing that my life completely changed from being in a place that I had a very little opportunity and very little chance of um, accomplishing a dream that seemed impossible to actually accomplishing it. So they all figured that if I could do it, there's hope for them and there's a possibility that they will be able to do it. And I think that's what most people were able to connect and, um, uh, and liked. So now that you endured with me, it's the time for to, to watch the video. So I'm going to start that if it's OK with, we're OK up there. under the stars and
Thank you very much. Thank you we'd, very much. We'd now like to open the floor up for a couple of questions from the audience, which I know you guys have them. So just go ahead and stand up, and there's be a microphone come around and grab you. Thanks for coming and talking to us. Uh, I've got so many questions, but I'm going to limit it to one that I think <laughs> yeah. is probably going to help me with my we have daughter. All night. Say again? We have all night. Thank you. <laughs> You came to America and had to basically adjust to what you were going to do with your life and maybe at a point, maybe your dream maybe dwindled a little bit. And what did you do to keep yourself inspired and create that, that possibility that eventually came your way? Uh, I, I never gave up on the idea that one day I will you know, fly to space. I had even a backup plan that if everything else failed, I had told my husband that when I die, if I had not flown to space, you have to make sure that somehow you get my ashes, at least a little bit of it, into space. <laughs> so um, I was determined that somehow I'll find a way. Um, I didn't know how. I had no clue how it would happen uh, because I went completely separate way. I was, I was in telecommunication, but, that, but I was watching as things were changing and uh, there was more emphasis on uh, people with um, some type of expertise, technological expertise uh, needed for the space program. I thought maybe after we finish you know, selling the company or doing something, then I can come back and try to do something in the space industry. Um, so I think it's just how much you believe inside your heart that helps you keep that dream alive. And uh, uh, there were times that if I had told anyone I would one day fly to space, I'm sure nobody would have believed me. No one believed us when we told them about supporting X Prize. You know, at dinner conversation, my husband would get a kick. People would say, "What are you doing?" He said, "Oh, we're helping people build spaceships." And they're like, "We work for NASA." No. So they, they thought we're crazy, completely crazy. But um, you know, it's just you have to believe in yourself. And uh, something my friend Peter Diamandis always wants to say: uh, uh, a lot of times, uh, something that's uh, called crazy soon after it becomes a reality is called the brilliant idea. So um, I think that that's what you need to look at. Yes, up there. Hi. Um, I met you, actually met you at the Ansari Prize, and I just want to say that you've not only come here to inspire our imaginations, but um, you should talk about the Be the Change, a whole program that you've got going on in education. And I met you at the Teacher in Space booth over there at, at, at Ansari, right by my Mescalero Apache Indian Reservation. So for you guys to be on our homelands was really, really stunning. And I honestly, I think you remember, I was practically brought to tears just being able to talk to you. To try to, I mean, what I'd like to see is you talk about your Be the Change program that you're having for education programs and all the stuff that you're doing to have our children put their eyes to the skies. Yes. Um, well, I, I've, I tell everyone, and I'm sorry uh, that I'm saying this for the adults in the audience, but I have given up on the adults completely. Uh, there's no way of changing them. So uh, my focus has been on uh, making sure that uh, we inspire our children to think for themselves, to use their imagination, and to gain knowledge through, whether it's through the technology that's, uh, that's around them, through internet, through school, through teachers, through parents, through everything. To gain knowledge, but at the same time, I encourage them to really, really use their imagination. and. Um, not to let their imagination be limited because uh, now I'm going to get on my soapbox. But um, I, I believe that our education system, it's so uh, structured that it limits the way we teach our children, the way we teach, um, you know, whether it's science or, um, you know, math or anything else, it's absolute. So we teach them that this is it. There's nothing that can be changed about it, which is not true. If Einstein believed that uh, you know Newton can't be proven wrong, he would never even imagine of his theory of relativity. So we need to teach our children that this is what we know today. 
And astronomy is my favorite subject because it's the best example of that. Everything that's taught in astronomy is taught as, this is what we believe right now. We don't know. I mean, the astronomy is the science of unknowns. There's nothing that's certain about it because you teach it today and then, you know, five years down the line, things that you believe completely changes. So I, I like to get our children to believe that whatever they're being taught, whatever they're learning can be completely wrong and they should challenge everything they, they, they're told. So that's what I do usually with my program. I actually, yes. I actually had something to say real quick. Yes. Was, uh, I, think, I think you and I share a dream and that's one day very soon, hopefully sooner than later, is that NASA is only a small fraction of what happens in space in the Absolutely. future and in the very near future. And that is what SEDS is all about. And that's why these students are here Absolutely. to learn about space and see why it is so great. And my question to you is, after the greatness that you were just part of, what next? What's, what's the next chapter in the new Shansari's life? <laughs> well, um, I'm still very, very active with the XPRIZE Foundation. We are still pushing the envelope on the uh, innovation uh, prizes related to space, but also we've expanded into other areas. So we're looking at um, genomics and um, bio, uh, biofuel and um, other types of uh, environmental um, challenges that we're facing. But again, my passion, my heart is in space, so my focus is on space program and we're looking at potential for uh, future orbital flights, uh, prizes related to orbital flights, and uh, perhaps even point-to-point -point flights. Um, outside of that, um, I think in order for us to be able to be successful in, in uh, exploring space, we need private industries involvement, full participation. Uh, people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are doing great things and uh, uh, they will play a big role in that and we need to encourage uh, that. So anytime I get to get on my soapbox with NASA, I ask them to support the private industry to get them more involved. And uh, through that, I think it will uh, expand. On the other hand, we really need innovation. We really need people, we need our children to get their interest back uh, about space and have hopes that they will be able to uh, have an active role in it. And that's why I go to a lot of schools and try to get little kids interested in being the next, you know, the first person on Mars or the first person who will come up with the uh, best uh, transportation uh, for us to Mars or best way for us to be able to sustain life in other parts of the universe. So get their thinking going that yes, it is not crazy, it's not science fiction for us to be able to live somewhere outside our planet. And that's it's up to them to come up with innovation. So that's important. We need that next generation to be able to come up with these innovative ideas. Yes. Um, you were talking about children going in space. I wanted to know when can kids like my age or a little bit older go into space? So I hope that, it, I don't think, I'll be honest with you, um, I don't think it will happen in my lifetime, but it will happen eventually. And the reason for it is there's a lot of things that happen to human body in space. Um, I suffered some of that. Uh, for example, when I was on the Soyuz, I had uh, really bad back pains and headaches, all of uh, which is a result of being in the microgravity environment. So um, the fluid in your body shifts, puts a lot of pressure in your head, and that's why you get headaches. And that's why you see a lot of the astronauts in their uh, videos, you see their faces are really puffy it's because of that fluid shift. Also, I gained two inches, which was really fun for me to be able to say I'm taller two inches. But uh, it was because my spine was stretching, so it was putting a lot of strain on the lower back. And uh, a lot of astronauts have the same problem. But your body adjusts. Uh, if you spend longer duration in space, you have the problem of radiation, you have the uh, problem of losing uh, muscle uh, density and bone density because your body basically gets lazy in space. So all these things we have to overcome. And that's why you need to come with a way for your kids to be able to go to space and enjoy it. So that's, that's uh, unfortunately, I can't tell that you'll be able to do it, but I hope your kids will be able to do it. Yes? I love your passion, wealth of knowledge and experience. Uh, 
I'm sorry. So I wanted to know what kind of a relationship you've had or will have with the Iranian Space Agency. With the Iranian Space Agency. I received a letter from them um, that um, they were very excited about my experience and invited me to Iran. I have not been back there. I hope to be able to one day visit. Um, I don't, other than that, um, I encourage students in Iran. I, a lot of people write to me and want advice on what they need to do to be able to one day also be able to fly to space. So um, I try to give them advice as much as possible, but I don't have any active participation. Up there. I'm sorry, it's uh, really an honor to be here and to uh, see you. Uh, it just blew me away when I read it in the paper that you know, one of four private citizens to actually been on the space station. Okay. And uh, I have a question, but I also have a comment uh, representing my generation. Uh, I'm 61 years old, and um, I, learned, I was thrilled to hear you um, so emphasize a spiritual component. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all one people, we're all one planet, and none of this foolishness uh, matters. Because uh, when I was drafted, I was 20 years old, and I fought in the Vietnam War, and it just brought it home to how insane all that stuff is, you know, and how it doesn't matter, you know. Nothing matters. If you're bleeding, it doesn't matter what kind of color, anything, you know. You just want help. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but my question is, why does it only take like four or five hours to get back from the space station? And it takes two days to get up there. And doesn't the space shuttle, uh, I'm showing my ignorance, the space shuttle take longer so you guys just like parachute down or something yes and um, so the soyuz is more like the um apollo program so um the reason it takes longer to dock to the space station it's not that it takes you two days to get to the orbit but it's the time it takes for you to be able to match the orbit and the speed and be in the right position with the space station because the space station is traveling at about five miles a second um, around the Earth, and uh, you have to be able to basically catch up to it and be in the right position to dock. So that takes uh, two days uh, to be able to do that. Why it takes two days, I, my orbital mechanics not that good, so I can tell you. Um, coming um, back, though, it's basically you deorbit and you just try to position in the right place. So when you start the descent. Uh, uh, procedure that you will land where they want you to land, which is usually they want you to be in Kazakhstan someplace. Um, so that's why it takes a lot less time. We have enough time for about two or three more questions. Uh, Mrs. Ansari, I'm very proud of you. Thank you. And um, I want to ask you, as you put it, when you were up there, you see the earth without any boundaries or the problem that we have on the earth. Did you have that feeling that you don't want to come back to earth anymore, stay over there? Um, I, I loved it up there. Uh, I truly, I told my husband that he, if he was with me, if it wasn't for my family and for him, I would probably, yes, I would love to just stay up there and live up there. If, on the station or somewhere else in, in space. So I, I just, I felt, when I, when I arrived at the International Space Station, I felt like I, I was home. So it was really a strange sensation. It wasn't, it wasn't new to me. It was like, I felt like I was meant to be there and I, I felt at home. So I loved it and the day that I left is the only day that stopped smiling. The entire six months I was training and the whole time I was there, I smiled so much, people told me that they're tired of seeing my smile. So um, I, I really, truly love that. Thank you. That segues into my question, which is, when the time came for you to depart and return to Earth, I heard that they had difficulty finding you. <laughs> you heard right. <laughs> Uh, I kept telling Jeff Williams, uh, he, he, he really wanted to come back because he was already there six months. He missed his wife and he was ready to come home. So I kept telling him, Jeff, what happens if you don't find me? He's like, I'm going to search the entire station because they won't let me go back without you. I'm not going to leave you behind. So I, I, I did try, but unfortunately, I didn't get to stay. Uh, uh, Charles Simoni, who flew after me, um, they had a delay in his return, and 
I really envied him when he got to stay one extra day on the station, so I wish I was there. Um, I hope to be able to do it again, though. I don't have any specific plans, but um, definitely on the Spaceship 2 or, um, you know, hopefully maybe another orbital flight before I won't be able to do it again. Excuse me. Uh, how much did it cost to make the Spaceship 1? Basically, I was, I'm wondering uh, how much would I yeah. get if I win your next prize? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, the cost of making Spaceship One was more than the prize money. Um, so I, th I believe they spent about $25 million. Uh, yes. But still, comparing it to uh, any projects at NASA, it was nothing. Uh, so if NASA was to do the same project, it would be in billions instead of millions. Uh, they recovered $10 million from that, and of course, commercializing it ha has had much more return uh, for them. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The prizes that XPRIZE Foundation puts together is built around uh, making sure that it's not innovation prizes alone. It's something that's using innovation, but it has to be practical. It has to be turned into uh, a business. So, for example, we just announced the Automotive X Prize. So it's not, it doesn't require a lot of innovation to have a 100 mile per gallon um, car. But the other rules are around making sure that these cars actually will be cost effective, would be something that people would like to drive, and it would become something that uh, would be mass produced. So those are the parts of the rule that sometimes is not highlighted. Yes? Um, me as one of those 25 million person, people who are like clicking on your web blog and enjoying reading your notes and everything, I love two phrases that you have written there. First is, uh, you will pay whatever cost is for your dream. And it, the second one, which I always think about it very hard, is it's hard to put a price on your dream. So I had this observation that you achieved the highest dream of your life with the price you've paid. Uh, so how do you feel of being dreamless? <laughs> <laughs> I'm never dreamless. dreamless. <laughs> that's, that's one good thing is uh, um, I, I, I didn't feel like, okay, it wasn't a check mark for me. Uh, flying to space wasn't something that I wanted to do once and say, okay, it's done. I, I really want to see people have a lifestyle that involves space and that one day it would become something that you would do maybe for vacation or for exploration or for, um, you know, research. Um, so I'm hoping that I will get to do it again. But um, actually I had a lot of, I guess, feelings about... Um, the way people should live or how our environment should be. A lot of these things got um, stronger and more emphasized after my space trip. So uh, before I may not have the courage to go after them because they just seemed too audacious. And um, now I feel like, you know, I saw Earth from up there and it was this tiny. So yes, it is possible to do a lot of things that seems impossible. So I am doing a lot of things in collaboration with many, many different organizations and uh, trying to bring people together to work more closely together and through, again, educating our young people to see, perhaps before I die, a brighter future for the next generation of humans on Earth. And then I have another question. It's like after talking about dreams that cost you millions of dollars, <laughs> do you have any comments for uh, people like me who whom their dream is not even like more than hundred thousand dollar in <laughs> expenses, but they can't afford the price. So, mm -hmm. what? I, I wasn't focused too too much on a price to pay for my dream. So as I said, and I was um, dead serious about it. Uh, I had told my husband when we got married, and you can ask him that. I said, if for some you know strange reason. I would be offered, and it was possible because I think it's going to happen with Mars. People will be offered a chance to go to Mars knowing that they may not return. And some people would take that chance. I would be one of those people. I'll be the second. <laughs> so I always said that if i given a chance to go to space by a one-way ticket and I would be paying with my life, I would go. So um, to me, it wasn't a matter of price. I think if you really uh, want to do something, and you're not shy about talking about it, you will come across people. 
I sort of feel that the, the universe will align to help you get to your dream. And it may be through meeting someone, talking to someone, that knows someone else who can do something for you, and eventually you'll find the path to get to your dream. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry about, well, I can never do it because I don't have the money. I came here with nothing. I mean, my family came here with practically nothing. We lived in my aunt's house, and she supported us for the first few years. I went to school using um, um, student loans and uh, financial aids. and. Um, so if I had focused on that, I would never be able to do what I did. One last question. Thank you. My name is Tessine, and I'm with the California Space Grant Consortium, which is here at UC San Diego. We're a NASA-funded program. And so we try to give um, undergraduate and graduate students experience that will help the space program and help STEM education in general in the United mm -hmm. States. But my reason for coming here is for my two boys. I wanted them to become inspired by you, as I am. I'm very impressed you. with your story. And um, I'm, I'm trying to get them interested in the sciences and technology. And so I thank you so much for coming. And I thank SEDS for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure, true pleasure. You're welcome. On that note, I want to, yes. Thank mm -hmm. you.